Yeah, um, I was I was just going to say, you know, I think a lot of it is, you know, when and I know there are a lot of students here, and you'll see this as you get older. Um, but your your formative years of your life are formed on campus, and it stays with you through your career, through your family life, through your kids, um, and it's something that I think only enhances, and, and it brings you back to a fond time, and, and it creates these positive memories in your mind, and I think that positivity, you know, leads you back to a time that, you know, is a different time in your life as work and other pressures get, get to you part of your life, you can think back to your college days, and I think that really resonates with a lot of people, and, and it just brings a very positive connotation. And, and secondly, you know, the, it's really, it's this um, remarkable business where every year there's thousands of, for our, or at least for our purposes, there's thousands of new Big Ten grads. So our audience, our, our, our market grows every year. Every year the school's in session, there's new graduates coming out from 12 Big Ten universities that are then active consumers or interested in, in, in our product. So, you know, those are a couple of really unique, you know, instances where, you know, it's just a naturally, organically growing market that all we then have to do is deliver, you know, an acceptable product to them, and we should be in good shape. It's an emotional connection that's the envy for pro teams. Uh, I remember a few years back, there was a, a playoff game when Golden State was in the playoffs, which might be like in the Ice Age, I don't know. It's been a while. But uh, the, the fans were jumping up and down. It looked like Duke. It looked like Cameron Indoor Stadium. And we all talked about the next day saying, how can we – it was so organic. It just happened. How can we make that happen? And the, and the truth is you can't. It, it has to happen. I went to uh, the Notre Dame game in Ireland. 32,000 people followed Notre Dame, went to, went, went to see Notre Dame play in Ireland. You don't see that. I mean, that, pros, we, we follow it. It's, just, it's not the same level. It's not that same – uh, degree of passion, and 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 we'd love to, we'd love to see it on the pro model, and we have the you know, Steeler fans travel well and they do very well, and that's one of my passions. But it's just not the same as college. And college is a little bit more pure, and it's a little bit more deep seated, and I think it has a longer a longer lasting life. Uh, I could do a book on the email and letters I get from passionate fans. <laughs> And uh, my favorite one is when the guy had his lawyer contact me to find out how much he had to donate to the Michigan Athletic Department to be entombed in the, um, in the tunnel at Michigan Stadium. Um, how much was Yeah, uh, 10, mil 10 million was the number. I, I think you went light. Yeah, I know, I know. But uh, it, is, uh, it is unbelievable the amount of time and passion that people put into their love for college sport and the level of detail. I swear to God, they spend two hours a day on the blogs and the level of detail that they know about what's going on with recruiting and strategy and everybody's a coach and everybody has an opinion and it's terrific because that passion is what we feed off of to grow these sports and grow these departments and make it big and make it important. We actually have a dog mausoleum in our stadium, so we don't have room for it. It works out rather well. But um, when the Big Ten Network started, um, it revolutionized college sports television, and it was the most innovative thing in a generation to come along in terms of creating a model that a lot of people didn't think was going to work, but it succeeded, I would think, you know, you know, at least up to your expectations and probably a little bit more. Uh, we've seen another couple of iterations of innovations in that area, the Pac-12 network starting this year um, and the Longhorn network. Long term, do you see, could Michigan start the Wolverine or the Maize and Bloom network or something like that with a partner, or is it a better play to stay in a conference space or with a group of schools like the Big Ten? What do you think, Mark? Should we start <laughs> off? Should we should we? talk afterwards. Yeah. See what <laughs> Uh, I, from Michigan's perspective, we uh, need and love the relationship and association we have with our our schools, associate schools in the in Big Ten Conference, um, and the the model that we have, where we kind of share and share alike and leverage off of one another's strengths in a whole bunch of different sports, uh, works really well for us. I think the the Longhorn Network experiment is still in the experimental stage. It'll be interesting to see how that all pans out over time because I still think that that's um, you know, something that needs to be reviewed. 
Uh, but the Big Ten network has been increasingly important to us just because of the increased revenue flow and the ability that we have to display and showcase so many of our sports. Uh, because it was never hard to get football and men's basketball on the air, but we're, we have 29 sports at, at the University of Michigan. We have 885 student athletes who work very hard to compete at the highest level in their respective sports, and we want to showcase them all. And the Big Ten Network has given us the ability to do that. Yeah, I mean, basically, if we're doing our job right, the, we are we are the Michigan Network, and and you know we're still in our growth mode, and you know whether it takes to form more of a of a digital product um, versus a linear network. Um, you know, you will see, and you know, ready. I think I think we'll have something close to seventy or eighty Michigan events on our air this year. So, you know, I think for all intents and purposes, you know, we that's what we are already building, and it may live partially on the Big Ten network and partially, you know, on, on another platform. Um, and, and it's something that we do have designs on, but a very different model than the way the Longhorn Network is, is really going about it. You know, we see the Big Ten Network as sort of the, the, the spoke of the wheel. And then you have 12 different universities, and we understand that the fans of the universities want their school's content, and they want as much of it as possible. So now it's up to us to create the content and, and have it available in a form that'll, that'll work with the consumer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also think the underlying rationale for starting the Longhorn Network was different. I know what the underlying rationale was for starting the Big Ten Network. Um, and at the time, we had no relationship with the Big Ten um, until Jim and I kind of came up with this idea. Um, I think Longhorn Network was, was built for different reasons. Um, I don't think you'll see, you know, maybe could, could Alabama do a, uh, an Alabama network? Maybe, but they won't. They'll do, they'll do an SEC network. Um, it, it, I think you find that the schools become too isolated. Um, it becomes harder to make matchups. Um, it becomes harder to build a, a, a broader a border broader uh, brand, I don't, I don't see single schools doing it. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can save that question. If you all in the audience remember um, that for the ESPN folks who are on panels later on in the day. But a uh, question from the audience from Frank Parkinson. How are the revenues of the Big Ten Network shared among the universities and ballpark? How much went to each school in 11? Uh, the uh, the Big Ten Network, um, our relationship with the Big Ten Con is direct with the Big Ten Conference. There's there's not a direct relationship financially between the network and the schools. Um, the network pays a, an annual license fee to the conference, um, and then the conference shares in in a degree of our profitability afterwards. Once the conference takes that revenue, it's shared equally among the 12 universities. Um, and it's a, you know, a nice growing substantial part of their overall media revenue that includes the ABC ESPN deal, the CBS deal, you know, and the, the Fox deal for the Big Ten championship game. And all that, all that revenue goes to the conference um, where they then cover their expenses and, and it all equally then um, gets divided from the media, the media dollars um, to each of the schools. Um, the amounts we really can't talk about. Um, you could go online and see what you could find. But... Um, that's all. That's all really private uh, information. Mm -hmm. I can scale it a little bit. Uh, we bundle obviously the revenues that flow through the conference distributions for not only Big Ten Network but the other media rights that we sell and the bowl deals. And to the University of Michigan, we our annual operating budget this year we are striving to hit 133 million in top line revenues, and um, and our distribution from the conference is around 25 million. So that gives you a sense for what percentage it is. How excited are you all about the football playoff? Is this a good model? And also, how durable do you think the four-team arrangement that's been discussed is going to be? I, I think it's, I can say with a pretty great degree of confidence, it will survive at least 12 years. <laughs> uh, and I don't pick that, that number out of a hat. <laughs> uh, where, where it will survive, I'm not sure. But... Um, the current TV deal that's being discussed is a 12-year deal. I don't see that model changing inside that 12 years. And the, and the way it's being set up in terms of where the bowl games are going to be played, if they can figure that out, will be for 12 years. So I think that model will stick. Um, 
I, where I think it's going to get interesting, uh, and, and, and I'm curious to hear you guys, is as the current commissioners, who clearly um, drive the BCS and the championship, retire, uh, you know, Mike, Mike's live at the SEC is going to retire, I would say, in three to five years. Commissioner Delaney will probably retire in 50 to 100 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> he doesn't get um, And so, and those two guys, to a great extent, are driving it. Um, Larry Scott's a new commissioner of the Pac-12, and, and, and Bob Bowlesby and, and Michael Resco. Um, as, the, as the two driving commissioners retire, does, does the thinking change? Does it, you know, who replaces them, and could that re- be a byproduct of, of restructuring down the road. I don't know, but I think for the next 12 years, you'll see a 14 playoff with the way it's being structured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think from a fan standpoint, it's a, it's a great positive move forward. Is it, is it the, you know, the, the greatest solution ever? I, I think we'll see. But um, I think as most people are talking about this season already, you know, they, there's a lot of speculation. Well, wouldn't it be great if that was already in place this year? So, you know, I think change, change sometimes just takes time. And, um, you know, the fact that it's moving in the right direction, uh, I, I think most, most fans, at least from a fan standpoint, think it's, um, you know, it's a positive move in the right direction. I think from an AD's perspective, um, I'm well aware of the fact that the American people can't get enough college football. And the more there is, the better. And that's good for those of you in the business of broadcasting it. And I think from our perspective, um, first of all, part of the rationale behind this was that there was all this stress over trying to decide who the top two teams were to have that national playoff game or that national championship game. So now what we've functionally done is added one game, and now we have to decide what the top four teams are, which just means instead of the number three team being upset and having their U.S. senator call hearings, we'll now have the number five team upset because wherever you draw that line, particularly when you have programs that are not competing against one another and they're not even playing like opponents, you're going to have a certain level of subjectivity. And whether that's passed on to the voters of the coaches poll or the media or whether it's a panel of experts, you're still going to have the same level of controversy. What, what I worry about is whoever those two teams are they are going to play in that last game are probably going to play 15 football games in that season. And I'm just here to tell you, with 85 scholarships and the roster size, and we can't go out and uh, pick up somebody off the travel squad or find somebody on a free agency. Um, these young people are getting beat up, and by the end of the season, that by the end of a 12-game season, you're typically the walking wounded, and when you play a 13th, 14th, 15th game, at some point you're really stressing these young people physically, and you're stressing their ability to get back into the second semester and be student athletes, and that's something we just have to be aware of. And we're guaranteed 12 more years of debate. <laughs> Social media, television, ESPN radio, Mike and Mike, 12 years about why the 15 didn't get in or the 16 or the 7A or whatever it is. But, again, that gets back to that emotional brand, and that's what drives the ratings, and that's what drives the business. So it, it'll be a, a nice, healthy 12 years, I think. Mm -hmm. For someone. For someone. <laughs> Here's a question about how much does um, – Obviously, televising games help or hurt attendance. I mean, this has sort of been a perennial question in college sports going back to 1984 or actually 1947, you know, in my range. But let me ask the question in a slightly different way. You know, at Michigan, Georgia, most other schools, um, media revenue, shared revenue from conference streams, it tracks, accounts for maybe a third, 40% of your overall revenue stream, maybe a little bit less than that if you're talking about $25 million, $130 million. But where do you all see the growth in revenue versus what you can get on campus, you know, from donations, from ticket sales, from merchandising, et cetera, versus from shared streams uh, through conference deals, bowls, et cetera? Well, our ticket revenue, when you also combine the preferred seat donation, which is really associated with ticket revenue, is about half of our revenue. So it is by far and away the biggest and most important element of our revenue stream that we need to protect. And we need to make sure that we maintain that kind of uh, strong positioning, which means we've got to fill seats. Uh, and, and I believe that one of the greatest challenges that we have going forward is 
when people have that ability to sit in an electronic recliner and watch their 62-inch 3D television set, um, in their home, uh, I've got to make sure that I have a compelling reason why they want to walk away from that and come to the stadium. And that has to do with the entertainment value we can provide, the halftime show, the pregame show. It's, it's how we treat them the minute they park and pull into their parking spot for their tailgate experience. It's how we can create wow experiences that make them go home and say, boy, am I glad I was at the stadium because I got to see that. I wouldn't have seen that on television. That's a, a marketing and event management challenge that we have to really make sure we're filling our seats. And thankfully we are, but that's the big challenge going forward to make sure that every seat in our stadium and in our arenas are full, particularly for those big events. And, and you know, you see it on the NFL side with the number of blackouts uh, in recent years, attendance low, uh, some stadiums with tarps on for NFL games, which is incredible. But uh, it's not going away. It's not going away for a number of reasons. One, technology is, has made it way too convenient and such a great experience to watch at home. Uh, the ESPN Red, uh, the direct ESPN Red Zone and DirecTV and everything else are really having an adverse effect on attendance in NFL games. In fact, I'm not going to name teams and I'm not going to name owners, but there's a team that's going to be blacked out this weekend despite the fact that someone wanted to buy all the seats and lift the blackout because the upcoming schedule looks like it's selling pretty good. The team's playing pretty well right now, and the ownership didn't want to lift the blackout. They want to see if people are going to let step up to the bar and buy the seats. So very, very interesting. Uh, again, your differentiation point here is the passion. It's the traditional rivalries. It's the tailgate experience. It's being back on campus. It's all the, it's all the reasons why I've got to be there that college sports has that are a little bit more insulation than the, than the pros have. And as long as you're able to keep that connection, not just between the alumni and the students and the athletic program, but between the alumni, the students, and the university, as long as that keeps strong, that's some pretty good insulation. Mm -hmm. This is an issue we, we deal with on a on a week-to-week -week basis with our, with our NFL owners. Um, because on the one hand, they love all the production innovations we've done with the first and ten line, with the Fox Box continuous score, with the sound, uh, um, with our phantom cams. And it, it not, I forget what the percentage is, but it's it's in the high 90s the percentage of people who only watch football. Their only experience with football is watching it on TV, not inside. So it's our job to drive that experience at the same time you know Dave Dave and, and the NFL owners have that trying to figure out how to balance that to get it in I have to correct one thing ESPN doesn't have a red zone it's direct TV uh, and cable operators uh, I, just, I just want I would like I would, a Fox guy yeah. <laughs> who I, thought I would, of the red zone if direct TV decided that my race were going to be a thousand dollars a year I'd write that check right now <laughs> and, I, and I, the red zone is is, is uh, in the long term could have some real negative effects yeah, on us right? I want to bring up a related topic and that is that we have a 12 o'clock kickoff tomorrow at Michigan Stadium and to you students we have a hard time getting up that early on a Saturday <laughs> call one another and make sure you get there in time for the kickoff Fantastic. Well, I've got two messages to pass along, and the first from the audience is to ask everyone to speak up. I guess they're having trouble hearing in the back. The second question is from the staff saying we are going to move to a Q&A. Um, so if there are microphones around or if people want to stand up and ask questions, we will um, answer them as best we can. Okay. All right. Can you hear? Oh, there we go. Hi, I'm, I'm Andy Schwartz. Thanks so much for a uh, uh, really informative panel. Um, I noticed that when you talked about what makes the fan connection with college sports, you really emphasized the tribalism and the alumni network. What I didn't hear anything about was amateurism. Uh, is that important? Is it a vestige of the past? No, I think it's very important. 
I think it's probably um, a direct source of the passion. There, there's nothing like going into uh, – tomorrow will be the first time I, I, I've been in the big house. I'm really looking forward to that experience. There is nothing in sports like going into a big college game. It, it's different than, than going into a professional game, and I think it is that sense of amateurism, that sense that – these kids are playing, and you know the seniors are playing probably the sport for the last time in their lives, and and it, it really brings a passion to it, and I think it's a good point. But uh, like that as an example, seniors playing for the last time, would that be different if they were getting a stipend? If they were getting what? A stipend. You know, I don't I don't see the connection between college and amateur. The way you described all those things you described are about what makes college great, and they're seniors and they're playing for their school. And you think, Dave, a stipend would change that? Well, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the word stipend. You know, what's been proposed uh, and the NCAA is evaluating, and I am in favor of, is that there has been a gap that has widened over the years between what the NCAA allows us to provide in terms of scholarship support and the true cost of education. And the best example, there are many, but the best example I can give you is that the scholarship will not allow us to pay for the transportation for a student athlete to come back and forth to school. So we recruit somebody from Southern California. Uh, we tell them that they have to report to school in Ann Arbor on a particular day to start fall camp, and yet they have to figure out a way to get the, the flights paid for to get back and forth to, to school. And that creates some problems because in some cases those families can't afford that. And so then who reaches out to them to try to help them um, fulfill that need and it gets, um, it gets negative. And so there is a proposal at, um, that's kind of being discussed where we could up the amount of the scholarship, not just for some student athletes, but for all of our scholarship student athletes to make sure that we cover the true cost of education. If you go beyond that and you get into this pay for play thing, I think it's ridiculous. Number one, it's not commercially. Um, I, you know, we have 885 student athletes at the University of Michigan. We may have one that might be um, a, an appealing uh, individual for an endorsement type um, commercial um, opportunity. Other than that, um, it's really not something that there's a big market for. And the day that I have to come to work and deal with sending 1099. Um, tax forms to student athletes and treat them as paid employees and pretty soon deal with unions and agents for 18, 19, 20 year old kids, I think you've destroyed the whole collegiate model and I don't think it works anymore and uh, it would be a very negative thing. They, uh this is a question directed more towards Mr. Silverman and Director Brandon. Uh, with Big Ten Network Student U being launched so quickly into the network's infancy. I was just wondering the effects that that has had on the exposure of non-revenue sports. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what the, the network has set up on, on each campus through the athletic departments an ability to pay students to produce many of the events that um, uh, would never before have been on television, field hockey, soccer, wrestling, softball, baseball, in addition to the events we also televise on, on television. We've been able to grow rough numbers from about 350 events to we'll be producing over 900 events this year. So what we're able to do through Student U is expose these sports that had never been on television before. Many of these are stream live and then air on delay on television because many of these events are happening at the same time across Big Ten campuses. But the exposure has grown. We've seen... Um, several sports, I can name three offhand, that the ratings year two or three versus where they are now have doubled. Still small, relatively small with football and basketball, but sports like women's volleyball, sports like wrestling, women's softball have grown tremendously. And we think it's a result of having increased exposure through Student U where people can watch and enjoy Sports they've probably never watched before. They've probably never thought of before. But if your alma mater is playing in a sport or if you play the sport when you were growing up or you have some connection to it, um, it's, it's actually helping the growth, you know, of these sports, which is, you know, then increases the ability to recruit um, athletes across the country. 
and, it, and, and you know, represents the universities in a, in a more positive manner as, as uh, more people are, are watching it on television. So it's been a key element in our growth that it's something that we're continuing to invest in with technology, with equipment, with training, with feedback to the students. And, and the, the thing, one of the things, not only is it the volume of the events that we're happy with, the quality is much better today than it was a few years ago. And that's the area that we really have to focus on continuing to make um, those events just look better on television and provide the students that are working on these events the right kind of feedback so that they can get better and potentially, you know, get full-time jobs in production. We've, um, I think there's about 250 students currently across the Big Ten working on student use. I think we've hired over 30 as, as uh, regular um, uh, professionals um, after they've graduated college to work on events at the various campuses. So it's, I think it's one of those few win-wins out there where the students get great experience, the, the schools get more exposure, and the network gets more events to put on its air. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for your time. Uh, can you talk briefly about conference realignment? We've seen a lot of it lately. Uh, can you talk how maybe it affects um, maybe adversely smaller sports? If you make a switch primarily for football or basketball. Also, a lot of schools have been committing and then reneging on those commitments to uh, certain conferences and how that kind of changes the model. Thank you. Um, yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, the, the, the collegiate business model uh, of college sport, I mean, it's, it's pretty broken. You know, if you take the 125 schools that, that are the FBS schools that have 85 football scholarships, the bigger stadium schools, at least the last data I saw, only uh, 22 of them were cash flow break even or cash flow positive. Over 100 of them are losing money, and the average subsidy per year was about $11 million per institution. So you've got presidents and athletic directors out there who are under a lot of pressure to try to figure out a way to break even uh, in an area where costs are escalating. If you look at coaches' salaries, transportation costs, financial aid costs, everything is going up way beyond uh, inflation and typically the ability that you have to increase your ticket prices. So um, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. And so uh, when a conference comes along and says, gee, we, we'd be interested in you joining our conference, and oh, by the way, you can double or triple the amount of media rights revenues you're going to receive, that becomes very attractive to presidents and ADs, particularly when you're losing money in your subsidizing programs. And so uh, it's really uh, driven by a somewhat necessity that if a school has an opportunity to greatly upgrade their sustained revenues over time, they've got to look at that proposition, and they will. And when one moves, it creates the ripple effect, because that hole that they've left has to be filled by somebody who could step in and maybe see that as a bigger opportunity. And then you get this game of musical chairs. So every time you see someone leave a conference and go to another conference, you start to see uh, everyone going through a reevaluation of their current situation, and what do they do to get better? And then the commissioners have a different challenge, and that is they think of they think of footprints and media buys and markets and demographics. And so commissioners are looking at is is another conference getting a bigger footprint? Are they getting access to greater recruiting territories? Are they getting access to more headcount? Uh, and what they're looking to do is make sure demographically they can match up with the other conferences because they're competing against one another as well. So. Long story, um, but we're gonna, we've seen a lot of conference realignment. I think you're going to see more. I don't think we're going to stop where we are today. There's a whole cottage industry now of consultants that are hired now to help colleges reposition themselves for the next conference move. So, and I'll just, I'll just give you a perspective here. Four, four schools to watch. Connecticut would be my number one to watch. Louisville, Cincinnati, and Rutgers. Watch, what, watch where they go. Watch what happens. And it, just like Dave said, and watch the secondary watch the secondary effect and and un unfortunately it's all they've said it's all driven by the media dollars and um, those four schools he just mentioned all happen to be in the same conference and those that media contract is currently up and depending on how that media contract works out will depend on whether those four schools stay in the big east or or migrate somewhere else and the What does that do to the tribal identity and the relationships 
Well, I know when we onboarded Penn State 20-some years ago and more recently Nebraska, we found that, that there's a huge amount of work to be done to assimilate a program like that. It, it says easy, it does really, really hard because you've got a whole new set of rules and standards and a whole culture that these conferences develop that you have to assimilate. It's, it's almost like a merger of any entities. And it takes time. And, and what we've discussed often is when you see conferences taking on two or four at a time, there's risks associated with that in terms of do you maintain your identity as a conference or do you start to become a patchwork quilt of what you once were. And so it's a very thoughtful, careful decision-making process that these commissioners have to go through with the help of the presidents and the athletic directors to figure out when to do it, how far do you go, and who do you do it with. I mean, D D Dave's right there. I mean, it seemed, it seemed somewhat organic from a, from a third party, Nebraska, to the Big Ten. Um, but as someone, when, when all the contemplation was going on about whether Texas was going to join the Pac-10, mm -hmm. as someone described it to me, that would, having Texas, the president of Texas and the president of Stanford at the same table would be like the bar at Star Wars. I mean, it was, <laughs> it, 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 I thought it was a pretty accurate description. Yeah. Um, it, there really is a culture uh, part of it, and I know, I know when, when the Big Ten is looking at that, they're trying to decide, does the culture fit in? Can that president sit at the table? Are the scholastics work? Do the academics work? It's not just, let's take this one and put it in there. And if you're a conscientious commissioner, you're doing that. Um, and you're not just looking for the media dollar. You've got, there's got to be a culture connection. Um, and, you know, it's like people are saying, San Diego State's in the Big East. I'm struggling with that. My question is for Dave Brandon. Where are you? Right here. Right in First row. Oh, hey. hello. <laughs> How are you? It's like God has a question for you. <laughs> it was omnipresent. Yes. Um, so, Dave, my question really relates to the revenue thinking and model behind facilities. So I've had the benefit, for, obviously, of, of living local and not only being in the big house, but also seeing the revisions to Chrysler and Yoast. Congratulations. Phenomenal job on those two. Thank you. But then I also see a college like Notre Dame that made the decision to build a new ice rink. So talk a little bit about the revenue model and decisions that go into rehabbing or refreshing a Chrysler or a Yoast versus just starting over in the vision that maybe drive different kind of revenue. Yes. Each one of those decisions is really different. For instance, the renovation and expansion of Michigan Stadium was a $226 million decision, but it had a significant return on investment associated with it because when we could sell the premium club seats and the enclosed seating, uh, we really generated net cash flows that didn't exist before that could not only pay down the debt from that initial investment, but over time give us a, reason, a significant return. That's been a double-digit double million-dollar benefit to the department to have made that investment, that capital investment. Uh, Chrysler is a little bit different, but similar in light of the fact that we've been be able to create premium spaces and we, ha we have a club area now with a, a place you can retire to, a premium area, and that will leverage and generate at least some revenues to help pay for the cost. Now, that's a $100 million project, and I think the incremental cost that we're going to receive of, of, of net dollars based on premium seats will require a 30 or 40 year payback, We're not a real smart commercial thing, but really provides us the ability to upgrade the plant and equipment so that we can recruit better players, retain great coaches, and go out and compete at the highest level. Um, hockey was a great, a great example of one where when we renovated that old facility, we actually had to give up seats, and we had to replace the seats that we gave up because of all of the up, upgrades for a, ADA purposes, all the different things, the elevators, installation of, of special needs seating. We gave up seats, but we were able to replace the seats we gave up with some more premium areas to make the revenues offset. When you get into the other sports, those are basically capital investments that you're not going to get any return on. You can't assume you're going to get greater admissions or higher ticket prices. In some cases, you're not even charging people to watch those contests, but you do it for recruiting purposes and to make sure that those student athletes have the same Michigan experience as anybody else. I think if you get into a point where you have the haves and the have-nots within your athletic department, uh, you're making a big mistake. We want, 
whether you're a member of the field hockey team, the water polo team, the swim team, or the football team, or anywhere in between, we want to make sure every one of our student athletes feels like they're practicing in and competing in facilities that are as good or better than anything else in the country, because that's how we feel about ourselves at Michigan. Sadly, we could go on all day with a fantastic audience and a fantastic panel. We've got to close it there, so please join me in thanking Dave.